Welcome to LHA Church. You're about to hear another inspirational message from Pastor Jerry Galloway, lead pastor here at Lighthouse Assembly. It's our prayer that this message is an encouragement and blessing to your life. If you have your Bibles with you today, if you'll take them out, we're going to go together to the book of John, the eighth chapter. John chapter number eight. And then once you found John chapter 8, if you'll turn back a few pages also and maybe put your finger in John chapter number 1. And today we're going to spend our time in these two passages of Scripture, John chapter 8 and also John chapter 1. If you have a mobile device with you, uh, you are welcome to use the YouVersion app. And as you uh, pull up the events, you'll find LHA Church, and all of the scriptures will be there uh, for you today. John chapter number 8, beginning in verse number 1. If you're there, say, I'm there. Then they all went home, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. And at dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law of Moses, it commanded us to stone such a woman. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down, started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Now, if you'll turn back with me to John chapter 1. This week in preparation for today, the Holy Spirit just continued to emphasize in my heart the word grace. Grace. The word grace, and that's what I want to share today concerning John chapter 1, verse 14. The Lord brought this passage back to my mind this week. John 1 and 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. And when John begins in this first chapter to list attributes and characteristics of Jesus, we realize, kind of like with this morning's service in in our praise, in our worship, there are many things we could say about Jesus. We could say he's a healer. We could say he's a deliverer. We could say he's our savior. We could say he's our comforter and our guide. We could say he's our protector and our provider. We could say he's a way maker, couldn't we? We could say he's the one with whom nothing is impossible. He's the almighty. He's the everlasting one. He's the first and he's the last. We could come in agreement with John as he pins these words through the Holy Spirit. 
But John in this first chapter in verse 14 says, in all these things that we find are characteristics about Christ, we should find two things. Verse 14 tells it. Grace. How many of y'all ever needed his grace? Amen. Grace and truth. Grace and and truth. Now, in the Gospels, we see Jesus in action. We see how he interacted with people. We see the things he stood for. We see the things he stood against. We see how he influenced people. Never has there been a person like Jesus Christ. A ministry of three years and literally turned the known world upside down. It has been said the Gospels are a biography of the life and ministry of Jesus. Each of the Gospels tell us about Jesus and each one tells us in their own perspective. It's, it's as if he sent them out with a camera and he said, I want you to take snapshots for the next three years. And what we would find is each one of those men would come away with a different perspective. And what we see as John pins these words we see he highlights the great characteristics of the love of God and the love of Jesus. It was John through the Holy Spirit that penned the words that many of us have known since childhood. John 3 and 16, for God so loved the world. John, he is the one who was known as John the Beloved. He was the one known for his love and his commitment to Jesus Christ. So it's no wonder when we read his perspective on Jesus that he would highlight the love of Jesus Christ. When we began to read in John chapter 1, backing up to verses 1 and 2 in John 1, we find these words, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. This same Jesus you see in the Gospels, this same Jesus you see in this story in John chapter 8 is the same Jesus that was with the Father at creation. Jesus is God in the flesh. God chose to come to this earth, friend, to be an answer for your life and my life. Jesus said the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus, my friend, was the answer for mankind. And in August the 13th, 2017, he's still the answer for our world today. John goes on in verse 14 there in John 1, and he says Jesus was full of grace. And truth. And these are two words we usually don't put together. If truth is spoken, we're accused of having no grace. But if we just speak grace alone, then we have no truth. The natural mind think, sees these things as opposites, but not in Christ. For in Christ they come together. The words grace and truth are usually not equated in the same sentence. In marriage, it's the same way. Guys, when you go with your wife and she's buying a new outfit and she goes into the dressing room and if she comes out of the dressing room and she says, does this thing make me look fat? You have two options. Grace or truth. The smart man in the audience will speak grace. <laughs> the foolish man will spend many nights on the couch alone. <laughs> grace and truth. They usually don't go together. Grace and truth are a paradox. It's like beauty and the beast. When you take a moment, friend, and you reflect on the grace of God, how many of you today are thankful for his grace in your life? Amen. Amen. The grace of God that looks beyond our sin, looks and finds us in our point of need. Friend, if you've not experienced grace and called it amazing, I would submit to you, you've not really experienced grace. 
Because grace says it doesn't matter where you've been. I can give you a new life. Grace says it doesn't matter what you've done. I can give you a brand new start. Grace says it doesn't matter what you've said. I've got something to say over you. Listen, friend, when you experience grace, you have to back up and say it is amazing because I didn't deserve it, but yet I've received it. It's grace. It's grace. Now, on the other side, we have truth, God's holiness, God's word, God's standard to the point that even on our best day, my righteousness and your righteousness, the Bible says, is like filthy rags. You see, the truth is the essence of the gospel. The gospel says we are sinful men in need of a Savior. The gospel says we have a holy God, and he's holy above all others. His standard, friend, is so high you and I can't attain it. It would be like this morning when you came in, if I said, now I want all of you to stand up and I want you to reach up as high as you can today and I want you to touch the ceiling. Well, the truth is there's some of you that are a little taller than others. Some of you are vertically challenged today. So some in the room may get a little bit higher than others, but still, even at their highest point, they will fall way short of reaching the standard. Friend, I want to remind you today that even on our best days, without him, we can do nothing. Jesus tells us these words, full of grace and truth. Now, we use, usually by belief or personality, will predominantly fall in one camp or the other. Some are more grace. Some are giving grace. Some are giving mercy. Some are filled with compassion, and that's what characterizes their life. Then there are others who are the rules people. Everything's by the rules. You ever known rules people? They're the rules. We go by the rules. That's why we have rules. They're rules. I'm going to tell you about the rules whether you like it or not. They're rules oriented. But John says Jesus wasn't one way or the other. Jesus was full of grace and truth. You see, truth without grace will crush people. There's no healing no restoration, there's no miracles, no mercy, no hope. Grace without truth, though, ceases to be grace. Grace without truth gives us a license to do whatever we like. Jesus was the fulfillment, though, of both grace and truth. He was not 50% grace and 50% truth. He was 100% grace and 100% truth. Now go back with me, if you will, to John 8, to our story here in John 8. Here's what we find. Jesus is teaching in the synagogue. People have gathered around him. The Bible says he came in, sat down, and began to teach. When all of a sudden the Pharisees burst into the room and they interrupt Jesus and what he's doing and they said these words. They said, we have caught this woman in the act of adultery. Now, the law of Moses says she ought to be stoned. What do you say, Jesus? Now, you, when you picture this situation, you'll find this is not a normal situation. This wouldn't have been easy. This wouldn't have been comfortable. Imagine for a moment if in this environment on a Sunday morning you and I are gathered to hear, hear and I'm sharing the word with you and all of a sudden the doors burst open and somebody in the middle of my talking yells out and says, we caught this woman and they come dragging her down the center aisle. We caught this woman in the act of adultery and the Bible says they drug her out and put her, forced her to stand in front of the crowd and then in front of the crowd said to Jesus, 
She was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says she ought to die. What do you say, Jesus? How many of you know that would have been a weird Sunday at church? That would have been an uncomfortable day. That would have been a strange day. That would have been something. Nobody, I guarantee it would have been all over Facebook in the afternoon. You would not believe what happened at church today. <laughs> it would been a lot of confusion on how to answer the feelings of being uncomfortable in that environment. But I would submit to you that day there was one person who was not uncomfortable. I would submit to you that on that day, in that circumstance, there was not one that was confused and his name is Jesus Christ. Jesus is never uncomfortable with our sin and our shame. Jesus is never uncomfortable with dealing with our sin. The Bible says he came to this earth to deal with our sin and to bring an answer. They brought this woman in who was caught in the act. And the Bible says they were trying to trap Jesus. Frankly, they were not even concerned about this woman. They were not about bringing justice for this woman. They were there with one purpose, to trap Jesus and give them a reason so they could accuse him. The truth is, humanly speaking, this would have been a very difficult situation because the truth is their arguments, the Pharisees' argument was right. The law of Moses did say that those who commit adultery were to be stoned. So the Pharisees' point to Jesus is correct. Isn't it amazing how we can be oh so right and yet be oh so wrong? See, these men knew the law like no one else. They knew the rules, but they didn't know the author of the rules. The Pharisees knew the letter of the law, but they didn't know the spirit of the law. The problem in the argument was that if Jesus said, don't stone her, they would accuse him of trampling on the law of Moses. They would accuse him of not standing for the truth. The Pharisees had already heard Jesus say that he didn't come to abolish or do away with the law, but he came to fulfill it. So if he takes the other stand and he says, stone her, Jesus was known throughout that region for his love, his grace, his mercy, and his compassion. They would have accused him of not practicing what he preached. The message would not be come to Jesus and find forgiveness. It would have rather been changed. They would have said to him, come to Jesus and be punished. There was a great challenge that day, and friend, there's a great challenge today in our day to, in the midst of our culture and even inside the culture of the church world, to find the balance of grace and truth. For with Jesus, this looked like an impossible situation, and I would submit to you that when culture is beginning to change, it looks impossible for the church. They thought they could trap Jesus with the word. Here's what they didn't realize. They couldn't trap Jesus with the word because John chapter 1 says he is the word. You can't trap him with something he is. He didn't know the word. He was the word. So the Pharisees looked at him and said this, what do you say, Jesus? Jesus had this way. Jesus could look at men and know their hearts. Outwardly, they might profess one thing. Outwardly, they may look another way. Jesus could look and see right to the very core of them. And when he looked at them that day, he saw hearts filled with hatredness. He saw their lack of compassion. He saw their arrogance. He saw their pride. And he looked at a woman, a woman on the other end of the spectrum, who was embarrassed, humiliated, broken, most likely. Can you imagine with me for a moment? They dragged this woman out of this place. The Bible says she was called the act of adultery. They drag her into the temple that day with a sheet wrapped around her to expose her and to embarrass her and humiliate her at the sake of trying to trap Jesus. I can't imagine what this woman must have went through that day. So what do you say, Jesus? Jesus. The law of Moses says this woman ought to die. This is no big deal to bring her here because the law of Moses says she should die for what she's done. What do you say? 
Listen, Jesus has a way of responding to things in a way that you and I would never think to respond. Jesus does things that you and I wouldn't do. Jesus does things we don't expect him to do. And that's what happened that day. The Bible says Jesus just kind of turned around and they, uh, as the leaders were standing there, turned his back to them and reached down and started to write with his finger on the ground. And so one of them said, maybe he didn't hear you. You need to speak up a little bit louder. Jesus, the law of Moses says this woman should be stoned. What do you say, Jesus? And the Bible says he just kept writing with his finger. Have you ever had a day when you were talking and somebody got a text that right in the middle of your sentence they began to look down at their phone and started typing while you're talking? That's where my goat's tied. I don't know about yours. So I can't imagine how outraged these Pharisees and religious leaders of the day must have been because Jesus didn't even acknowledge them. He just turned his back. And began to write on the ground, it says. And the Bible says they continued to question him. And they continued to push him. And they continued to prime him for words. Now, for many years, men have hypothesized what Jesus must have been writing on the ground that day. Some thought he maybe was writing the Ten Commandments out. Some have said maybe he wrote, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Some have hypothesized that he was writing the names of the leaders that had come that day and listing their sins before them all. Some have hypothesized many things about what he was doing that day. The reality is, friend, there's nothing in the Bible that tells us what he was writing on the ground that day. You see, what he was writing was not as important as how he responded that day. This woman was caught by the law. She was caught, the Bible says, in the very act of adultery. She was, it wasn't a rumor. This was true. Caught in her sin. Jesus, in response to the law that day, he reached down and he got on the ground and he touched the dirt and then he rose up and he responded to the law. You see, when the law had caught this woman guilty of her act of sin, Jesus came and touched the ground and then he raised himself up and responded to the accusations that were against her. It's a picture of the gospel when you and I were stuck in our sin, bound with shame, bound with history, bound with a past. Jesus Christ came to the earth and touched the dirt of our humanity. And then on a cross, he was raised up and he responded on the cross to the accusations that were against us. When the woman was caught in the act, Jesus stooped down, touched the dirt. He touched the dirty places of our lives. He touched the dirt, friend, that we're made of and then raised himself up on a cross and he began to speak against the words that set themselves against us. You see, the reality is today, you and I are that woman. We were caught in the act of our sin. And if the law had had its way, friend, you and I would have been stoned and killed. But thank God for Jesus Christ who left heaven and he came to this earth to touch us. And then he raised himself up on a cross and there he died for my sin. There he died for my transgression to set me free. That day, Jesus responded to the Pharisees. And he said, any one of you who's without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. The Bible says they began one by one to look at their lives and realize that they too were not much different than this woman on the ground. You know, it's easy to reach for the rocks. Reaching for the rocks is natural. But when you and I realize we're not much different than those around us, reaching for the rocks doesn't work. 
one by one, these men, these religious leaders began to drop their rocks. Then he said to them, he that's without sin cast the first stone. Let me ask you a question today. Was he ignoring her sin? Was he ignoring what she had done? Was he approaching the situation just by saying all she needs is grace? No. Remember John 1 and 14, Jesus is full of grace and what? Truth. Full of grace and truth. Now to stone someone in Old Testament times was a very serious thing. And the requirement for stoning someone, you had to have two people, two witnesses who saw the individual or the individuals in the very act. Then the two witnesses had to come and they had to bring the woman and the man to be stoned. When Jesus asked the question that day of the Pharisees, he was really asking them, if you're so concerned about the law, where is the man who was committing the act with her? It has been considered, it has been rendered that the reason they couldn't respond is because it was one of them who was committing the act with the woman. Jesus was saying, you're looking at the filthiness of her flesh, but what about the filthiness of your heart? The Bible says when he asked the question, one by one, the Bible says it began with the oldest, one by one, they began to leave and drop their rocks. The one without sin cast the first stone. Then he begins to speak to the woman. You'll notice in the story there, he says, woman, where are your accusers? She said, there's no one. I have none. And you know in her mind, she had to say, will you, they're gone, but will you yet accuse me of my sin?" Jesus responded to her and said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Leave your life of sin. This is important. Jesus did not negate the fact, and here's where, folks, listen to me this morning. Here's where we get tripped up with grace in our modern culture. Jesus did not negate the fact she was supposed to be stoned for the law is the law. You see, today we want to lower the truth so we can have grace. Jesus wasn't saying she wasn't supposed to be stoned in accordance with the law. He was just saying that day these men weren't qualified to do the stoning. We can't change the law, friend. We can't change the standard. We can't change God's word. We in this hour need to hold high the standard of God. We need to hold high the word of God. We must not shift. We must not compromise. We must remain true to the word of God. Friend, if there is no truth, there can be no grace. Without truth, you and I wouldn't even know that we needed grace. You can't separate grace and truth. Even though, friend, today our world around us is changing, God is still the same God. His standards are yet the same. That day the Pharisees said to Jesus, somebody has got to pay for what this woman's done. But what Jesus was saying to them that day is somebody's going to pay, but it's not going to be her. What Jesus was saying that day, I'm going to pay the price for her. I'm going to take the stoning that she should have gotten. I'm going to go to a cross, and I'm going to pay the price that she should have paid. I will pay the price on her behalf. Instead of holding rocks in judgment, Instead of holding rocks in criticism, our lives should rather be characterized by stooping down and touching the dirt of humanity and reaching out to someone realizing that we aren't much different than they. Do not forget, friend, you cannot have grace 
without truth. You can't have unmerited favor without the truth. The truth says we have all sinned and we're in need of a Savior. If you take out the truth, listen to me, if you take out the truth, you rob grace of its ability to be amazing. When you take the truth out of grace, you'll just have something ordinary, but it won't be amazing. I wonder today, as you've walked into this room, I know that every one of us in this room has a past. There are things about our lives that we wish nobody knew. There are things about our lives the truth is that we only know. I wonder today, do you need grace? Do you need his grace? I don't know what's brought you to this church building today. I don't know what set of circumstances have been building in your life that's brought you to the place where you're at. I don't know. I don't know what might have been in your life today that might cause you to be like the woman in this story. The truth is we all have a past, and part of that past we're ashamed of. We're embarrassed of our past. Friends, that's the miracle of grace. Hmm. Now, generally, we would speak this message and we would speak it, and yet I do speak it this way to you who don't know Jesus Christ and you need the forgiveness of sin. My friend, there is grace no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done. Jesus Christ can transform your life and give you a brand new start, and that's the miracle of grace. But also, I would speak grace to you in this way today. Many of you have received the forgiveness of sin in Jesus Christ. You know Jesus as your personal Savior. But friend, you've not allowed grace to redeem your past. You've not allowed grace to free you from the past that haunts you. You've not allowed grace to come in and rewrite your life. You, many of you, remember, you remember what you've done. You remember the moment. You remember the place. You remember the eyes of the person that looked at you in your situation. You remember the words people have spoken. And you've not allowed grace to come in. Listen to me. And release you. Release you from your past. Don't be fooled. Every one of us in this room have a past. Do not be fooled if today we have the ability to cast on the screen shots of your life and pictures of your life over the years. There would be many times all we would be able to do is hang our head in shame. It's been said that the ground at the foot of the cross is level. We're all the same place, the same situation, the same circumstances. Grace. Grace is what we need. Grace is what we need. Friend, I want to encourage you today to allow the grace of Jesus Christ to bring healing to your life. You see, you may not be able to release yourself from the past, but the grace of Jesus Christ can rewrite the story of your life. Would you bow your heads this morning? Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for every person in this room under the sound of my voice. And I pray, Father, right now in this moment, I pray that the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ, I pray, God, that it would begin to flood this room. I pray the truth of your grace would begin to flood this room and to minister, Heavenly Father, to every person in this room. God, every one of us, you know us by name. You know everything about us. You know our past. You know our present. And, Lord, you know our future. Father, today I pray for the men and women and young people across this room today that they need the miracle of grace. They need the miracle of grace to come and restore their life. They need the miracle of grace to release them from their past. They need the miracle of grace to free them from decisions and shame 
of years gone by, of a past they've been redeemed from, but Lord, they've not been let loose from. I pray the grace of Jesus Christ would be amazing in their heart and amazing in their life today in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray for those today, God, who've been saying in their heart, I need, I need to get my life right with God. Some of you are here today because you've been saying, I need to get in church and I need to get my life right with God. Friend, for you, grace is available. His grace and His mercy. Listen, friend, you can't get your life right on your own. It's only by Jesus Christ and His grace. I can tell you why that's why I stand here. I don't deserve to be here. But I stand here today in His grace. And friend, as you walked into this church today, you can receive His grace in your life then I believe there's some of you that are here today. You've come to this church today and you've got a big need in your life. The Bible tells us there were people as Jesus would walk through the town, people who had enormous needs in their life and they would cry out, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me, Lord Jesus. Have mercy. Friend, today I don't know what you're facing and I don't know what you're up against, but I can tell you the mercy and the strength and the grace of our God is available for you today. So no matter what's brought you to this church, what I'm trying to tell you is that Jesus Christ is the answer. So Father, today... Today, would you touch each one? Father, today, would you minister to their heart? And Father, today, minister to their life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Would you, as quietly and reverently as you can, would you stand with me all across the room this morning? I don't know what's brought you to this church today. I don't know what last week, last month, last year, last 10 years have been of your life. I may not know, but I know one today with whom nothing is too hard. And so today, if you come to this place and you say, you know what, Pastor, I need grace. I need grace to help me for a past. I need grace to bring healing to my life for some past situations and circumstances in my life. Maybe you're here and you say, you know what, I need grace today. I need grace to forgive me of my sin and cleanse me and give me God's unmerited favor. Maybe you're here today and you say, you know what, I'm like the one in the New Testament when Jesus walked by I said, Jesus, have mercy on me. I need you, I need your help today. Maybe you're that individual. Friend, no matter what your circumstance, so I'm trying to relate to you today, is Jesus Christ is the answer. You can keep searching, but the answer is only going to be found in Jesus. So Paula is going to begin to sing this morning. And as she does, I'd like to, to have the opportunity today to pray with you. Because I believe all things are possible. To them that believe. I believe there's nothing too hard for our Lord. And so today, if you've come and you've got a need in your life, we'd love to have the opportunity to pray with you and to believe with you for your circumstance today. So as Paula begins to sing, I'd like to encourage you today, if you'd like prayer, We'd love to have the opportunity to pray with you. And I would just, when she does, I'd invite you to step out from where you're at, friend. And would you join us down here? And we'd love to have the opportunity to pray with you today. Will you come? If you've got a need in your life, no matter what the need may be, say, I'd just like somebody to pray with me today.